Welcome back to Zero Books and Repeater Media. This is Adam from Massive Horizon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Niall Griffiths to talk about his latest novel of Talons and Teeth, out now on both paperback and audiobook with Repeater. Niall, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. So this just started off with uh, kind of the, the elevator pitch of the novel, just to give people a kind of a sense of what they're getting into with this book, because it's, 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 I mean, I mean, the setting speaks for itself. The setting is basically a new character, but how would you sort of just pitch it in terms of general to the audience? I suppose in a few, in a few words, I'd just say Deadwood in Wales, I guess. Um, although it's based on a true, on a true story, a true and terrible tale of Sean Agoff, of which primary material we don't have very much. Um, but Deadwood was a big influence um, when I was when I was writing it. I'd, I'd, I'd seen Deadwood a couple of times and absolutely loved it. And I thought it'd be interesting to transpose this to Wales and put it lay, lay it over the top of what of a of a factual happenstance. You get a real sense of Wales being sort of the the unacknowledged frontier, not only of, of, of like empire, but in the sense the unacknowledged frontier of. of it's, it's kind of the beating heart where it's all happened. You can't really understand sort of the history of the UK and in even sense, you know, what it's doing to the rest of the world without looking at those margins. The truth is there in the port cities, in the advances in mining technology and the carelessness of which sort of lives are thrown away. And it really comes through in the book. I mean, um, I remember recently in the interview, you talked about sort of your dislike of recent kinds of attempts at doing historical drama, historical fiction. And so what made you want to pivot to historical fiction and say it's you're doing it with Of Talent and Teeth? Yes, I find um, histor um, historical fiction, I find it a, a kind of escape, an escapist thing, really. I suspect that people don't really know what to do with what we have now. You know, the, the plot spoilers of mobile phones and and, uh, and the like. People don't really know how to incorporate these things into their text. I, when I'm teaching, I just get so bored of someone on the, the, the protagonist on the first page dropping their phone in the sea or something. So that's one way to get rid of it. It's just so predictable. So I do find people going back in time to the time before we had these. And in that way, you can utilize traditional plots. But, I mean, you can't really help who you fall in love with, you know. And when I found out about Sean Agoff and his story, I kind of fell in love with him. And then I like this idea that, um, you know, this this phrase dystopia, um, it's, uh, dystopia, utopia. Well, you have the same thing with time. So it's a kind of a dyschronia. <coughs> and since the Brexit vote, we're looking back a great deal to a uchronia, to the golden age that never existed. Certainly for most people, it doesn't, ex it doesn't exist. America's going through the same illness as well for the past few years. Um, so I, th I like this notion of, of this this bad time, this dyschronia, which is really kind of history for most people anyway. History is written in blood, you know. So the things aren't coterminous. The uh, the furniture of the book isn't coterminous. I mean, when when Sean was around, wolves weren't around. Wolves were still weren't in Wales. The Newcomen steam engine was invented a long time before Sean. But I thought I don't. I didn't really want one specific time. I just wanted this this bad time, this bad period. That, as I say, is the truth for most people ever anyway i mean sure i mean you know shauna goff is definitely a character out of time in the sense of i mean he he doesn't seem to be a particularly christian character he's very much into his sort of folk magic the folk spirituality the folk psychedelia of sort of the the, the remaining sort of mushroom seasons and i mean him and, uh, and another character edric you know they, they they do sigilizations they're doing they're carving runes but even then they're carving runes of stuff that they have seen or heard of being brought back from across the you know the so-called new world over in the americas and there's yeah. there's a real yeah. there's a real way in which you do sort of play with the the ideas of writing in the book even we're talking about uh you know when they're talking about the you know the the infamous the, the knots that people would get around their neck for speaking for speaking welsh instead of the, the you know the english colonial language um or even when 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 catherine is teaching taking sean to 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 write and to and or to read and he says well, you have to learn to cipher you know the ciphering in english is basically hiding something there's a there's a kind of a secret put inbuilt within the language and that you're that's being forced upon you and i just want to ask yeah about this this idea is how writing itself as an act plays in the book because there's there's the writing of the landscape and there's a sense in which the, the landscape is part of that 
writing process. You know, we're, we're carving lines through it through mining. Uh, we're carving uh, runes in it. We're tattooing our bodies. You know, there's there's so much wider textuality in the text. You know. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with that. And of course, there's. I mean, I think Sean or is it Edric, well, one of them speaks anyway. Or maybe they have a conversation about it about the the narratives that, that that we need to learn to read we're forgetting these narratives of the passage of birds across the migratory birds across the sky or the um, in the in the mud or the snow the movements of animals in their in in their prints it's this kind of the world speaking itself um that we're that we're in danger of ignoring at that time as i say and the the non-specific time a lot of people who've, who've read it are saying how prophetic it is um from from all from most of my books but of course the prophecies they foretell were living in now you know and at the time you know the the history of the world was, was being was being written by club by colonialists you know um Sahaba goes on about the east india company and what an extraordinary thing this is that of course was trying to rewrite the supremacy and, mag and colonial magnificence in inverted commas of a power like like britain at the time you know so beneath that I wanted to show that there's all of these narr narrative structures going on of vast importance and that a lot of them are permanent. Well, if not permanent, because, you know, the world will one day end, then a lot more written in stone, sometimes literally so when he talks about the fossils, um, the, written in stone a lot more than the watery, the watery intransigence of mankind, you know. Um, and it's Sean and Edric who are, who who re recognise this, and then we know what happens to them both, of course. No spoilers, but um, the repositories of myth, of myth and, and 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 narrative and and, and self-expression that they are, does it die with them? Well, I don't think it does because that's what I'm kind of you know that, that, that's why one reason why I've written the book, and one and one reason why I, which I didn't mention in the afterward, and I should have written I should have really written in the afterward, but we had. Sean lingered. Well, actually, you still see Sean's, Sean's corpse, what's left of it, in St. Fagan's Museum in Wales. But until 1937, his wing-dried skull was, and his gibbet was in a chemist shop in Machuntlach, which is a market town not far from where I live. That was until 1937, in a pharmacy, a place that, you know, lures you in to cure you. And then there's this, this wind-dried, mummified young boy. So his story carried on, and we still have Purshon Agoff, which is where he tried to drown himself. That still exists, and you can go and see it. Um, so these stories, you know, they linger and 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 they stretch and they and they and they influence. I think, but now I think we have to dig for them. We have to find that they're. I mean, it's what writers do, and what readers do, of course. We do it all the time. But I think we ha we're having to dig dig more for them. That was another reason why I was drawn to writing an historical novel. Notwithstanding my caveats and misgivings that that that, that I've just outlined, was this uh, although I do it in my in my fiction that's set con, con, contemporaneously, I still do it then. I draw on I draw on myth kitties and historical r repositories and, and as such. But I wanted to get back to a place where not where these stories began, because it's kind of that kind of on, ongoing, but somewhere where they let they were still they were still palpably alive rather than being alive in our epigenetics if that makes any sense i mean there's there's a strong sort of i would say subplot's the wrong way to put it about digging deep in the book and something is found which challenges the dominant narratives i mean you know, sort of it's a spoiler to say that the, the preacher says that this is this we have found the bone of the nephilim is put here by satan and everyone else is going no this is a, this is scientific and there's this constantly this one of the things that's so good about the historical novel form is you get to do a bit of archaeology but you don't hit rock in a way you sort of hit lava you hit active things that were sort of latent underneath the ground that form those very layers that we stand upon today and and especially the 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 struggle over narrative itself. I mean, you have you have Edric, you have Edric and Sean's sort of more paganistic, to use I guess a term that would be applied by the Christians to everyone else. Um, spirituality, more animistic, and then of course you have uh, Preacher Evans standing for the very sort of C of E, well, I guess C of W at this point uh, style of Christianity. But then even, I mean, even Evans is a. Uh, is cast aside at one point by a militia man by people who think you know his God is over. I mean, uh, Sir Herbert, you know the. 
the the, the Aristo law, the, spe the lingering spectre of feudalism and capitalism, says you know to 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 Lloyd at one point when he's offering him basically you know, a, a devil's bargain to not take this is to spit in the eye of the creator because there's there's a kind of a real unity of his historical theological and narrative uh, conflict that goes throughout the book. And there's, I, don't, I wonder oh, if you could actually unpack some of the various spiritual flip threads and influences that go into that conflict. I find, I mean, the, interestingly, um, for all of their pagan leanings, I'd, 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 I would imagine that Sean and Edric would be much more amenable to the notion that the bone belonged to an extinct beast that actually walked, that actually walked Wales, you know, which it does. Um, it's the preacher's. It's the preacher's denial of um, of aspects of the world and the world's story. I'm. I don't really have much time for for this notion that um, you know writing rough fiction should be like anything else. It should be driven by science. Um, in a world of in 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 a world of uh, a world of um, resurging superstition. I mean, it's part. It's always seemed to me that part of the creative writer's job is to. Um, explore or at least entertain the notion that there might be a dimension to human life that is uncalibratable by science. Um, and I've always, I've, I've always found that fascinating. So I don't really see them. I don't really see Edric's and Sean's um, worldview as clashing with the scientific worldview in in many ways. I think I think they really they really ascribe. To certain impulses, which science may one day explain if it, if it can be bothered to, it's the preacher's um, narrow. It's the preacher's denial of of certain aspects of available reality, and then of course we know that the we know that the preacher is a bit of a hypocrite anyway. When it, when it comes down to it, you know. So it's that it's it's that it's that kind of monolithic ideology that I've always tried to attack in all. All my work and the preacher embodies it in 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 this one, as does I mean as does as does Sir Herbert. You know, his God is Mammon, basically. That, that that's who he worships. Um, to the extent that he's a crusader, and you know, in in, in and, and I mean that quite literally, in, in in the sense that he is part of a organization that will chop down people who don't ascribe to its ide ideology. Yeah, in in, in relation to the. the the original sort of uh, pagan aspects, it it also kind of cuts off the extent that the the preacher cannot recognise. I guess what in sort of in sort of post colonial terms, which we call now like a sort of a Welsh way of knowing, now in terms of the actual connection to lands, and of course most fundamentally the language, which I mean this this is why it's so sort of beautiful to see sort of the Welsh language weave throughout the book, and ne and never in a way just at which you you're sort of left puzzling. You can t the context is always illuminating even if you don't understand it i mean in terms and but then linking it back to sir to sir herbert he you know he says he admires what the east india company wants to bring it here i mean only is that prophetic of you know what they call foucault's boomerang it's it's tested in the imperial periphery ends back in the imperial core and wales is treated as kind of the, the periphery of the core in that sense i mean there's I mean, yeah, can we talk about the, about the the aspects of colonialism here and in the characterization of Sir Herbert? Because I mean, I I really loved his character. I loved hating him, um, but he 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 wasn't so much a caricature because when you go back and read like discussions of parliamentarians, people like you know Francis Galton or even like someone like John Stuart Mill on this paternalism and that, you 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 see it. it it's hard to even believe that people actually spoke like this, but then it feels it feels overall. But then. It's believable he does. You can see it. You can see him bringing that in the form of the technology, the the miner's friends, as 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 it shows up later. Yeah, yeah, I do love that phrase, uh, the Welsh way of knowing. I like that. I, again, Sir Herbert was based on a on a real character. Um, he owned a lot of land not far from where I live, and and he did do that. Um, if he wanted people out of their out of their cottages, out of their tied cottages, and they didn't want to leave, you know, they had some rights. He would. Put, he would put a, like a Persian rug down their down their chimney or a sheep down their chimney and get the bailiffs to break in in the morning and you know say well this is my sheep you stole my sheep you know um, and they'd be sent to the colonies or sometimes executed that didn't really bother Sir Herbert you know Sir Herbert of course is Welsh um, so very much a, a a conniver and a colluder in the in the colonist attitude it didn't really bother him at all power 
power. And when he says, you know, a new God is coming, this kind of thing, it is this notion that, of course, it's not where capitalism began, but it's where, I'm trying to say, it's where the, it began to, it began to sprout and mutate into something all-consuming and become, become this, the, the beast that feeds on itself, you know. Um, it just becomes power for power's sake, wealth for wealth's sake. I mean, we see it now all, all the time. You know, what did I read? What did I read yesterday? That the six most power, m- most richest people on earth doubled their doubled their wealth their, their, their wealth last year. These people are already trillionaires, you know, but they double their wealth. The six most people, powerful people on earth, you know, and they they have more money than b- billions of people, and I just find this mind blowing. And it seems to me that that was the, this was the point at what at where this was happening, whether 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 the earth, I mean, the East India Company were locusts in many ways. You know, the earth was there to be raped and pillaged and plundered and abused in the in terms of this marriage of wealth creation being somehow a moral good, um, a moral success, you know. Um, the whole notion of working six days a week is to plant God's kingdom on earth, this this Protestant idea. So Sir Herbert signs up to that, um, very much so. And as I say, he he, he invites in the the plunderers um, and becomes an enthusiastic participant in it it himself. So kind of (coughs) looking back on it now, you think, well, this is what was happening then. Um, um, you know, the point he was trying to say, yeah, this was then. This was a few hundred years ago. Where are we now? We've done nothing to stop this. We've, in fact, we've done everything to encourage it. Really, and it's 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 bleak. It's bleak in that way. It's quite a bleak book, isn't it? Really, but then it is true to what happened. And, you know, he was gibbeted. Sir Herbert did was part of the East India Company. All this kind of thing. Um, and the more tra- the more travel I do, especially traveling around. Um, ex places, places that were ex British colonies. You know, you find the ruination that was done, and the and the and the hangover. I was in India last year, um, and although they've turned in, they've turned like you know old polo clubs and old cricket clubs into places of artistic pursuit, which I like. It's still this big hangover of this this expected way to behave, and there's a lot of bitterness there in the Indian people, and I don't blame them. I mean, I've got eyes to be honest. I mean, in terms of even in terms of just returning to the, the Welsh context of thinking about uh, the Raymond Williams talk, it must have been about a year or two ago that um, Michael Sheen gave, and immediately any 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 sort of Welsh metal band with its sort was quoting parts of that. It was like leading up to a great sort of crescendo, and then the music comes in, and of course, yeah, oh, the the- Brexit. Oh, the, this was when Michael Sheen gave the, gave the talk to the football team. No, no. Um, it was Raymond Williams' lecture, basically on sort of the he gave a memorial lecture to, on the sort of the future of Wales, basically, and sort of ah, and yes, oh, I dressing up, yeah. dressing up yeah. as much sort of righteous anger as possible. I mean, even thinking about sort of how this spreads throughout the world, but thinking about particularly the character of so a bit more. I also really love the way you characterise uh, his depiction in terms of. He's just in as mired in a much sort of filth as everyone else's, to the extent that his his wig is full of maggots. Things occasionally fly out of him. Uh, he, our betters are no betters, and it's it's also just fascinating in terms of the way in which his relationship to everyone else, who everyone else is lower class, and he is the he is the most up, he is the most posher one in the book. It's that of pure management, and it's just think how it corrupts people as well. I mean, uh, for example, the character of Lloyd, who. Um, it's, sometimes it's almost a little bit of the protag- almost the protagonist of the book. I don't think this book has the yeah, protagonist. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to, uh, but it, it, the corrupting influence of wealth on him, the, the sort of the pressure to render everything in terms of coin, and of course the pressure that puts on his family and how it destroys the family dynamic between him and uh, Catherine, you know, to a horrible extent. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit how that your depictions of the corrupting aspects of wealth as it seeps down words through the very class structure it imposes on people yeah 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 and i should have said in, the, in my in my last point you know what one of the notions of the um of the the the, 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 the driving force of the the welsh setting is that even though there are a lot of welsh people and irish and lesser irish scottish people who were enthusiastic enthusiastic participants in the in the colonial enterprise 
never forget that you know England and Scotland were, were, the, were the, and Ireland of course were, were the first colonies of sorry not England Wales and Scotland and Ireland were the first colonies of of England in many ways but as I say those countries also produced an enthusiastic participants yes um again it's a thing you see now um and, and what a writer I write about it in the more in, in in well all of them obviously really, you know that they're all set in the present day how poverty corrupts and how wealth corrupts obviously you know wealth um i mean only this morning i was watching well it was came up on the radar i wasn't really watching it and i can't even stand the man's face let alone hear his voice for jacob Rees smog and you just think how what a hollowed soul he is you know what a hollowed straw man he is you know and partly it's wealth to have none of that worry to have no, none of that um i mean look at my face i'm only 23 you know, but I've just been so poor all, all my life, you know. It lines your face, you know. Um, and yes, and the way it trickles down, and that's the, you know, the awful notion of, of essentialism, you know. We see a thief, you know, they're thieves, they're just thieves, you know, but they might be stealing food to eat, they might be stealing nappies or baby formula or, or, or something of necessity, you know. And of course, that's less of a crime than what Jacob Lee's Mogg does, investing in pills that are used for anti-abortion at the same time he makes spitting up being Catholic anti-abortion, and yet he's investing in pills that are, are used for abortion. So this this hypocrisy and this and this this utter what 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 money what money what wealth allows you to do it seems is to completely divest yourself of the duty of self analysis and self assessment, and you and and that to me is just the most poisonous poisonous thing to do to live a life without self examination. It seems to me an utterly hideous thing to do, and it leads to great, great suffering. And the way that trickles down, it trickles down in the immediate way, the more part, the, the more tangible way of needing th needing things, you know, needing money, um, needing food, needing a, f a phone, you know, you know, needing these physical items, you know, and that to me seems a lot more excusable and and conscionable and forgivable than allowing yourself to be hollowed out to be scraped out by your surety in yourself <coughs> it seems to be a very very dangerous thing to do there is a really heartbreaking scene in the in the novel when people are selling their stuff basically ev literally everything uh to get on the to get on a boat to canada and even 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 the good luck charms that that, that Sean and Goff's like gives them, they sell. Like, well, no luck, no money buys the fate. Uh, not nothing yeah. else. It's it's the absolute detachment from everything other than most immediate conditions. And yet you can't help but sympathise for it because it's what what does the money buy you? It buys you impunity. Uh, you know, the, exactly. it buys you a literal rupture in the, in the causal structure of the universe in the sense because yes. you you no longer have to. I mean, yes. Sir Herbert yeah. can do what the fuck he wants. You know, it it is. I mean, even when when one of his uh, his staff is is literally dying in the most sort of quite tragic comic way possible, he's just like, oh, he doesn't really care. Doesn't yeah. really care. Yeah. Can you do it quietly, please? Oh my God, I hope it rains soon because you're starting to spell. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is impunity. I mean, Mog yeah. is of course a fantastic example of this because it, it's all. I mean, he's he's not even got the impunity of uh, no, not even got the ability to be punished for pretending to be an Aristo when his dad's an old newspaper man. It's all yeah, completely yeah. false, and yeah, it's, and yeah, then... it's just cosplay. Yeah, <laughs> cosplay yeah. is the but best way people, of putting it. But these people hold so much power over us, um, and I just find that despicable and um, disturbing. But it is where we are, and what we what what can we do? Well, we can use anything in our arsenal against it. You know, my one of my weapons is writing. You know. And reading as well. I mean, you know, you know, we, we often forget that writers are readers, and to me, it's as it always has been. It, it's a it's a way of feeling vividly and excitedly alive. You know, I don't do hard drugs anymore, um, but sitting in a chair with a little cat on my knee and, and a cup of tea and a book looks so cozy and nice. But actually, there's a there's a maelstrom of emotions going on in me. You know, reading Melville, I want to throw the book across the room. You know, things can't stand this anymore. It's too much. You know, it's this. Um, it's this. It's um, it, 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 there's an immense power in it. You know, so yeah, um, it's one of the weapons open to us is art. The, the sort of emotions I was getting whilst reading this book was one sort of a sense of yeah, that that tragic kind of classical catharsis of. Uh, Particularly the, the narrative between Sean and Catherine, the constant will they won't they sounds like a um, a constant uh, 
sounds like a, a sitcom vacation, but also just just <laughs> seething in that atmosphere because it it's a book that feels wet, feels muddy. Everyone is coughing all the time. I was coughing whilst I was. I mean, is it? It, the landscape is quite literally infectious, and sometimes you're listening yeah. to it, especially yeah. with a good ambient record on, you guys get a sense that everyone is trying to stop themselves from screaming. Catherine, who does seem to do the work of the entire fucking village, <laughs> Lloyd, who can't get anyone to do any work to fix the, the, sh- the church, um, Llewellyn, who is, well, don't mean Llewellyn for one, but also Dick Buck, who like just gets in the fight because there's nothing left to do. The, the boredom of the area is, and even, and of course, the literal mountains themselves so hollowed out that they are but giant screaming <laughs> monoliths yes, at this yes. point. Screaming um, mouth, and it, yeah. And it's, it's, it's just, I don't know, it feels very much like being alive in 2023 in the kind of political situation because you just feel like every, there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, it's an oncoming train, everyone is screaming to stop you know, genocide across the world to ask for any kind of reprieve, and the system has said, uh, no, you're getting Keir Starmer and you're going to like it or else, you know, it, it is it is that locked in syndrome into history where you can see it's going on a crash course and you don't know what to do. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, I, you know, I'd much sooner Starmer than any of these twerps that are in power at, at the moment. Um, but that's not really saying much for Starmer, although I do, I do, I do like some of his what would form his cabinet, Jess Phillips and the like, you know, I think these seems to be um, decent people. But yeah, it, it's uh, it's difficult to not kind of give in sometimes, isn't it? You know, um, and think, you know, where is the hope? Um, that said, though, that said, I mean, some of the hope come. But one, one thing I I kind of upbraid himself for not doing in 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 the book was having more. Uh, sex scenes, not human, um, animal sex scenes, and to show that because it says it's described, doesn't it, when Sean and Catherine do have sex, it says it's 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 they're like beasts. But then I thought, no, no, my point there was to show that they're coupling, um, as kind of you know sweaty and brief as it is, it is a thing of human contact, beautiful human contact, um. And that's why it's the only scene of that, like, well, this obviously they're in the brothel, but that's a transactional thing, you know, with them it's a it's an it's an entirely different thing. And the house that Sir Herbert is based in is a it's based very loosely on a mansion not far from where it's called called Nancy Oss, which is where Olga and Swinburne used to go. Uh as a matter of historical record, and he of course turns up at um, Sir Herbert's house. So the novel I'm writing now is all set on one night in, in this mansion. Um, of a wedding reception. And it's basically just this kind of um, howl of, this, this pleading howl for recognition of love and, 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 and resilience in the, in the human spirit. So I wanted to bring that in. And also the beauties that they have, you know, the beauties that they have when they're tripping on the mushrooms, you know. There's, there's the notion, is that because they're hallucinating or is it because this whole thing about hallucinogenic psychotropic drugs is are you seeing beyond the, are you seeing behind the reality into a deeper reality, into some kind of more objective truth that the messiness, the splat and clamor of humanity is masking. So there's that kind of notion behind that as well. So I always I always try to um pinpoint, shine a light on some possible beauties when I write. Kind of hard to do at times, but I think it's essential that we do it. No, the, the psychedelic scenes in the book. I mean, I, I, I always think mushrooms are possibly one of the most interesting psychic, well, spiritual form of psychedelics. But which I mean, just because of the the literal connection that, I mean, you know, mushrooms make soil. Mycelia make soil. Some of the biggest organisms we've ever seen are mycelia. A forest is technically alive, and it's also they always provide a fascinating thing into the continuity of life and death for me because. Um, I mean, it rots and decay with mushrooms become not a negation of life, but a transformation of it. You know, decay is in, what's the, what's the, there's a phrase from, oh God, some online joke, which is, which is about mushrooms. It says, yeah, you ask, pointing a gun to a mushroom and saying, tell me the name of God. And then it just says, decay is an excellent form of life. Um, and I thought, that's just a, a really beautiful sense of continuity there. I mean, the psychedelic scenes, 
I mean, is 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 there is there a lot of psychedelic fungus in sort of a uh, Welsh folklore, or at least until oh, do we have evidence for it? Is there that... is. I think there is, yeah. Um, but I think it's kind of masked. Um, I think you have to look beyond uh, a bit. You have to read between the lines of of some of the of some of the primary materials. I mean. It seemed to carry on within the seventies. You know the Operation Julie thing that the Clash sang about. When, to, although that was acid, that was that was manufactured at LSD. But that was, that's the place in Tregaron, not um, again twenty miles or so from 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 where I live. And that seemed to, well, of course, it would be in Wales. One, it's remote, but two, because it was a place where um, it was a it was a, a kind of mecca of hippiedom in some ways, partly because of the the the. You know, the climate produces a preponderance of hallucinogenic fungus. You know, there's a rehab place. Well, it was rehab, and now it's been bought by um, uh, groups of Hasidic Jews who come to visit in, in the summer. But it was rehab up the mountain behind my house, and it kind of um, it was it was a darkly humorous that when people coming you know com- coming out of all kinds of all kinds of dr- drug abuse periods, um, and there'd be there'd be this free arrangements on the floor around them and they'd have to you know walk to the to the canteen or whatever just walking through these forests of psilocybin mushrooms and they were thinking all i need to do is bend down and eat a few of these you know but they couldn't do it because because they were in in rehab so i like that juxtaposition of that it's all it's all around you and what you just said about this whole thing about the 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 connection of fungus on my ceiling, which I've been doing quite a bit of research into recently on how forests talk to themselves and speak to themselves. Um, I like that notion that it suggests and embodies in itself interconnectedness, which the effect of psilocybin itself makes you makes one feel that. It's almost like it's almost like the rep- the representative physicality of what you ingest is transmuted into your thought processes and i quite i quite like and again this links with epigenetics um which is a thought that i'm just kind of toying with at the moment. well i'm not toying, i'm exploring this at the moment you know it's notion epigenetic epigenetics that past trauma can affect descendants genetically this notion i find really interesting so i'm um, yeah so i'm trying to link that somehow with with um the ingestion of 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 fungus, and how themselves plants form this world, this interconnected world. It'd be, it'd be interesting to write something along the connection of something like. Um, well, have you ever seen the film In the Earth? Mm. Yeah, mm. it's uh, the, the amazing Ben Wheatley film where this this legendary sort of witch creature is actually just a, a mycelial network, and they yeah, talk to yeah, it using yeah. noise music. I mean, just, yes. just, just throwing yeah. out there, but absolutely. Just that was one of his best. Of I think. Yes. Ben Weekly is at his best when he's when the ground is a character. Yes. Like in High Rise, he's he's good at he's good at making architecture speak. Hmm. And in, 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 in the same way, I think of Towns of Teeth is great at making mountains speak, because you, hmm. you kind of feel you feel sorry for them. They've been completely hollowed out. I mean, let's actually talk a bit more about. Um, mining actually, sort of what sort of research and how sort of mining is centered in the story because the changing nature of mining is, of course, a huge plot point, but also it's hard to talk about any sort of resistance to that, to, to you know, to the processes that are going on in Wales without talking about the strength of mining communities and also the strength of communities generally because there's a hell of a lot of different communities in this book, um, especially in goes like the market towns. Of course, there are, there are Roman Sinti people, there are sailors who are stocking off, there are, of course, the, the entire settlement themselves and what, what community and, binds them together through Catherine. And the Native Americans he meets. Mm. Which apparently is true, again. Um, you know, this historical record gives us this. Mining, I mean, where I live is dotted with our old mines, slate mines largely, and ore, which is ore in in in, in the book. So I wanted to use ore rather than coal because Wales is well well known for coal mining, but there was also ore and slate, of course, there was slate. So I wanted to look at that kind of a lesser known um, mining niche. And also it's been going on here for a long, long time. And then I wanted to look as well that, again, Whilst the destruction of mining communities under Thatcher is, was, was, it was and is to be utterly, utterly deplored, I did want to 
kind of I'd like like Orwell did. I did want to kind of show that mining again. It wasn't this golden age for most people who were involved in mining. It was it was it was premature death. It was discomfort. It was poverty. It was filth. It was grime. It was disease. You know, it was only for the mine owners that it was a it was it, it was so, it was some kind of golden age. Well, silver age, you know, bronze age. Even it was never golden for anybody. So I wanted to show that again. I wanted to 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 look at the reality on but behind the myth of these things, and at the same time, as I say, um, the destruction of the destruction of of, of the mining community is to be utterly deplored. Utterly deplored, partly. Um, and there's many reasons, but one was that it was Thatcher's desire to destroy the working class as a political force in Britain, um, and that was that was her bugbear. That was her. That was the vanguard of her um, of her ambitions. It seems to me. And one of the ways in which you really sort of hem in on the the, the destructive nature of the mining work is through the omnipotence, you know, the omnipotence and the omnipresence of of illness. I mean, um, I mean, the, the, the book begins by talking about you know, before a time of viruses and things to counter them, and I and of course you know, everyone is coughing, everyone is hacking from the preacher to Sir Herbert, a bit less so in Sir Herbert's case. Lloyd Capper, everyone is constantly in a state of viral fatigue or just or illness. And I was wondering if if just how much the the experience of the of the pandemic fed into the writing process of this book. Um thinking about these days before we even had what me what means we have now and how that affects people within the same honestly very similar economic circumstances, precarity, capitalist domination, always reigning, like <laughs> environmental collapse. It's a set, very similar circumstances, but without those those niceties that make illness, I guess, manageable or curable. Yes, I mean, I it, it was in my, it was in my mind that the rough period of when this is set, rough, very very roughly, um, you know, maybe a hundred years really, kind of meshed into into one, it wasn't long to the Black Death. Um, it was only about a hundred years so after the Black Death. So that was, so there would have been memories of that, you know, which decimated um, the population of Europe. So the, there would have been memories of that, but at the same time, I wanted to suggest that what we've just lived through with the, with with COVID nineteen is quite new to us. Again, a hundred years ago, we had the flu, the Spanish flu, but it is new to us. It's not unprecedented, of course. You know, it's, it's happened before, but it was different this time. Um, the way we were, the way we, way we were connected still uh, on screens, and how that—it's um, too early to say yet—but how that has how that has affected our outlook on friendship and familiarity, and clo- and human closeness that we're so used to seeing each other on screens that we were for for a couple of years. You know, we couldn't, and then when we could see each other, there was almost this strange thing: of, can I hug you? Can I touch you? You know, there was there was this thing that you had to kind of address the natural impulses that you have that, that each person has you know peculiar peculiar to, to to their personalities so it was this kind of notion as well is that history is what we live you know that was that was more as i say it was more looking at echoes of history rather than what i took to be and what i present as being the the, the lived reality at the time coterminously it's kind of what we we're we're, de- we're dealing with the echoes now. The 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 echoing aspects of of history, it, it it it's it's why it's why the book feels both so relatable. Hopefully not too relatable because it is it, it it is of course a very tra- tragic story. But it's 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 not hard to picture. It's it's not it's not hard to picture yourself in sort of the midst of the, what was then, I guess, still partially the old Celtic rainforest, you know, and. And actually, being even wood, wooden um, grit of it, because the relationship between the people themselves are, even though you can't necessarily empathise with the lack of technology, they feel really feel immediate. They don't feel as mediated through the niceties of screens. You know, you see, for example, just uh, even just Lloyd or Dick Bark talking to each other, like in some really sort of harsh ways, or even just kind of, well, I guess we call now sort of locker room talk, and you think. Can't you can say it. Not every, everything's recorded. It's, it's a pre-recording time. The only thing that's being recorded really is you know the con- uh, whatever the priest can sort of guilt trip you with, or or whatever uh, Samuel's taking down in his tax ledger, and it's 
it is it is more of a, a free flowing sort of discourse, which I which I, I just know I just really enjoyed because it allows characters to kind of breathe a little bit, as said from the omnipotence of the phone, because the, the phone in a way is also another kind of this is sound a bit pretentious capitalist domination. No, I don't mean that in the string sense of you know that you're like you're working on a factory line, but everything you're making on hey, we're making data right now, we're making content, you know. So uh, this is this is working for YouTube. We're we're filling in the gaps between the advertisements. <laughs> there is there is that creeping in of everyday life to that that additional relationship which is you know not i mean we're making content you know content production <laughs> yeah it's 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 not difficult by any means but to try and imagine yourself back in back into this time was it was a really interesting thing to do and also you have to you have to remind yourself to be era specific all of the time you know all your similes and metaphors have to be era specific and names for things like the like the, they talk about meat birds um um you know the, the welsh word for raven is key brand which means meat crow because ravens eat meat you know but also they don't you don't know in the book whether they're hawks they're just called meat meat birds which i'd imagine they would have they wouldn't have called a red kite a red kite or barky gawk in, in welsh as far as i know they wouldn't have called a hen harrier a hen harrier or a kestrel a kestrel. These things would have been meat birds, it seems to me. So you had to be era specific all of the time. And it was quite an interesting thing to do. It was quite um quite a thrilling thing to do, really. To to keep, you know, the way your the way your your the writer's mind works, just having to keep bring to to bring in an an, an an editor and say, no, no, you can't use that. That wouldn't work. Don't use that. And then and, and not rewriting, but but presuppose what you're about to write and then stop yourself from writing it. So when I so I thought, well, the second draft is going to take, can take an awful lot of work to, to excise these things. There was very little of it, really. There's only, there's, only, there's only only a few instances of it, of that clash. So I was quite pleased with myself. And it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a fascinating thing to do, um, to arrest your, con to constantly be arresting the flow, to, to, to check that you were being, true i suppose and authentic i found that intriguing so have been said a that bit like i'm oh, sorry go on. no go on i would say it's almost a little bit like a it's kind of a self psychoanalysis you're going back and you're encountering all of your habits coming up to the forefront in order so that you can bracket them out you're sort of bringing them up from habits from the unconscious into experience so that they can sort of dissolve upon contact with the actual object the actual air of, of what you're writing yeah, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and that air is acidulated from various mind workings and factories. It's why Jacob Rees Mogg can't fucking write. I mean, um, his book on the Victorians. Oh, oh my god, atrocious. I don't know. Why I know. Johnson can't I write. Into, oh shit! I'm going to just fall over. <laughs> I, did, I did into there was another I, again. What stuck me this morning? I mean, fucking Rees Mogg, and I'm hearing Lee Anderson. You know, Thirty P Lee. They both said the same thing. They both said exactly the same thing, except. Reese Mogg said it in this ridiculous patrician drawl, you know, whereas Lee Anderson said it in a few kind of grunts and mo monosyllables. But they both said exactly the same nonsensical, meaningless, self-serving rubbish. But Reese Mogg will get the attention because because of the way he speaks. If you think if Reese Mogg spoke spoke like Danny Dyer, no one would pay any any attention to him. We it's so buried in us this this forelock tugging deference. I think it's poisonous. And again, I wanted to bring that in with Sir Herbert. You know, there's a, there, there is a lot of deference to Sir Herbert, a lot of a lot of disrespect as well. But even in those who disrespect him, their outward demeanour is one of is one of genuflection to him. And that, that was, I think that was that, that was, I think that was when it began. I know we'd had a classism before that; it's so entrenched in Britain. But I think that was when it began because class was equated with wealth, which was equated with some something, some virtue somehow. Um so I wanted to pin to try and pinpoint that moment when that that's that 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 started to happen and started to become widespread. I mean that's that's not to go too, you know, Nan Anderson about it for any of the history buffs listening, but it's he he is he is both a bourgeois and he's a lord. It's uh, Britain's sort of knack was actually fusing the two class interests together. I mean, we've still got, I mean, back when sort of my own sort of, uh, not sort of hometown, I, yeah, I lived closer for a bit, Romford. I mean, it has a hereditary peer. 
And he was brought in in like the, well, not him, his position was brought in in the 1850s. We still have, I mean, uh, to, to, when uh, American friends or even friends from Europe ask me about sort of like you know, what the city of London is or, oh yeah, most of these, you can buy a house in uh, Westminster. Well, you probably can't, but if you could, you'd have to pay tax to the Duke of Westminster, who's our age. Um, and that's for a few thousand years. And it's dredging up to the, the echoes of feudalism is so good because it, it shows people how, we're not that far. We're not that different, basically. We're not that far. Yeah, we haven't moved on much, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think we. I, I, I don't think we have. We haven't moved on from that. It's just become <coughs> disguised and camouflaged. But it's definitely there, undoubtedly. And as I say, I'll say it again. This equation of wealth and virtue is just poisonous. It's toxic, and we really need to get rid of it. It's not unique to Britain either. You know, I think America suffers from this. Um. But it's just a toxic, toxic notion. It's so destructive. It's, it's one of those weird Protestant hangovers that we did we didn't quite excise during the Civil War because the Civil War, at the very least, had a couple of couple of good lads. Had a Gerard Wynne Stanley, a couple of good uh, good diggers, levelers, commies, department yeah, debates. Yeah, yeah. But but sadly, yeah. they they need to turn those swords into plowshares, and then maybe back into swords for a little bit just in case. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know we're going up to about uh, the hour, so I just want to ask a, few, a couple of questions just to round off. So, one, um, I mean, what what's next? Are you working on anything else at the moment? Yeah, as I say, um, this novel's set one night in this um, wedding reception, um, which is which was interesting to revisit the mansion. Well, as I say, now it's like a hotel, and you can and you can go there for you know drinks and things and meals and stuff. Beautiful place. Um, it was deadly. Well, it was half deadly for a long time. Round the back in the stables, what used to be the stables, there were some flats and people used to live there. And um, it's supposedly teeming with ghosts. There's a couple of brothers who I spoke to. Um, and one of them, and they lived there, they were brought up there for when it was semi deadly. Um, one of them always wanted to see ghosts and never saw one. One of them never wanted to see ghosts and saw them all the time. So I like that notion of this, of this mischievousness, a bit like cats. You know, cats will, will cats will go into a room, seek out the person that doesn't like cats and jump on their knee, you know. So I quite like that idea. And some of the ghosts are pretty scary, you know. But the history of this house is interesting. Um, as I say, Algernon Swinburne used to visit and he'd go to Aberystwyth when it was a working port um, and consort with the sailors there from various countries. Um, he was very into BD, um, BDSM, apparently. And there was one guy... Um, there was the woman, um, the, what, one of the guys who, who used to own it, um, who was shot um, in the First World War. Well, four days after the armistice in the First World War, and he was shot seven times in the back. Um, his own men said it was a German sniper. It was probably just them, to be honest with you, because the man was such an arsehole. And his wife, you can see across the valley to, to a hill um, called, called, called Pendinas. And when he'd gone, his wife used to go and wave a white flag from the flagpole. And the guy she was seeing who lived across the valley would see the white flag and he'd come dashing across on his on his horse and you know and they'd take advantage of her, her husband's absence. So all the history in this place I find fascinating. Nancy Horse, which means stream of nightingales. And it has ginkgo trees, it has a pet cemetery, it has a wall garden. Um so yeah, it's it's kind of based on loose the, the, the mansion in, in Towns and Teeth is loosely based on the appearance, on the on the physical appearance of, of of this place. So that's what I'm writing now. Yeah, just this, it's just set, set in one night, this wedding reception. You never meet the bride and groom. It's just the people who, it's just the, their guests and their interactions and how their interactions build up throughout the night because they the only message of the night before. The, the bride is, is from Northwest Wales, the groom is from North East Ireland, um, which is kind of my, my heritage, but I didn't kind of realise I was doing that when I was writing. I was kind of work, working through my DNA. Um, also, 2% Norwegian. There was a character who kept suggesting himself this Norwegian barman. So, oh, no, he sounds good. And then, yeah, in the DNA test, it's 2% Norwegian. So I didn't even, I had no idea. It was Vikings, got everything, didn't they? So I found that fascinating to me. I was working through my own DNA, even though I didn't know it, you know. Um, you know, these, these serendipitous things throw themselves up as a, as a writer. So, yes, yeah, so all this is, I keep reminding myself, um, this isn't a grim book. This is meant to be a book in praise of human love and resilience but at the same time um um there's a lot of grim stuff in it but the point of it is is that 
Well, actually, no, I'm going to, now, now, now I'm spoiling it, I'm giving everything away um, about this book. I've got to work on it this afternoon, so I'm going to stop it. But anyway, I'm, I'm, in, I'm very much enjoying writing. It's a bit of a departure for me in some ways, partly because it's so hopeful, I guess. Normally the stuff isn't, you know. Although I do always try and bring in moments of beauty, transcendent beauties in everything I write. Um, and I find that, I think that's where the hope lies. You know, these, what would you say? I was reading George Saunders last night, his latest one. Um, Liberation Day and it's just this astonishing passage when he says he steps back from the main um, from the heroine um, and there's an astonishing passage and he says oh here it comes she realised she loved her life and then it's just got three little instances of one um, the family of ducks that walk through her garden as if they own the place and just these little moments that, that, that add up to, to the love of human existence I just find it an astonishingly beautiful passage. So that's kind of, that's, I keep trying to do it all the time. You know, the world keeps giving us these gifts. And the world r r remains stunning and beautiful. It can't help itself. Um, despite what, we're, what, what we've done to it and what we're trying to do, so it, keeps, it keeps throwing us these gifts. And we need to, um, we need to accept them. Well, to, to modify Repeater's famous slogan of everything when it comes down to uh, refusing the evilness of a world that tries to impose itself on us we are welsh and we don't agree uh <laughs> that's brilliant yes, that's we've, got, we've, got, we've, we've got we've got we've got so many like like bangers of welsh excellence on on, <laughs> on the backlist we, we, should, we should really try to like highlighting that a bit more and that's what i'm trying yeah, to do I today so. i mean i mean there's, mm. it, there's a couple of events this book coming up in there i know on february the 23rd you've got an event with uh housemans yeah housemans um, and the day before, um, in in Birmingham, in Heath and Voce books, which are both in King's Heath, in the same night. Um, and then got down to London to Hausman's. Um, and then I'll be in London for a couple of days. I've got some to the Ukrainian embassy. Um, not to do with this book. <coughs> but um, it was an interesting thing. They got some British writers to react to some writing from Ukrainian soldiers. Um, and my guy was this diarist called Bogdan. Is, is, is a teacher um, and his diary's translated into English of course which is stunningly stunningly beautiful and he's fighting so hopefully we, we can fly him over from Ukraine um, but anyway yes but Housen's is the is the main one in London for Towns and Teeth yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll see you there good and stuff hope, hopefully good stuff. as many listeners as possible will also see us there too um, there'll be there's a link up to it soon on the actually there's a link up to the Houseman's one now on repeaterbooks.com slash events there'll be a couple more as, as it gets a bit closer to the time but all that's left to say is that well Niall thank you so much for joining me you're very welcome Adam you're very welcome everyone go buy it of Talons and Teeth audiobook or paperback or both you know no one's going to stop you alright folks I'll catch <laughs> you later yeah I'll see you in London we appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.